Okay, welcome everyone to uh, this very special event, uh, which is really a combination of a discussion around Palestinian rights at a very crucial moment in Palestinian history, um, and also uh, the launch of a very special book by Professor Lynn uh, Welshman, uh, which details the history of Al Haq, which is the first Palestinian human rights uh, organization. This event is co-hosted by uh, the Center of Palestine Study, which I, uh, at SOAS, which I chair. I'm Dina Mata, uh, and I'm the chair of Center of Palestine Studies. You have all the de details on the website. Uh, it's also co-hosted by uh, uh, Professor Bishara Dumani's um, uh, Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University, and of course, uh, and not least by uh, the School of Law uh, at SOAS, which is chaired by uh, Scott uh, Scott Newton, who's going to be in the discussion. Um, I don't want to talk much about uh, what is uh, what the discussion is going to be about, but what we're going to do here, I'll just tell you about the, the way we're going to uh, uh, manage uh, this uh, forum, uh, is that each of the panelists, we have uh, five panelists who will be talking, we have six panelists who will be talking about <sighs> Um, issues related to uh, human rights, Palestinian rights, the law, struggle, and uh, resistance, and all kind of speaking to and with uh, Lynn's book uh, from different perspectives. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting discussion, I hope. I'm going to give each speaker about 10 minutes, uh, and then uh, we'll go on to the next speaker. I introduce each speaker as we uh, get to them. And I encourage everyone to put their questions in the Q&A um, questions uh, um, kind of icon at the bottom of uh, Zoom. And also for those people who are joining us on Facebook uh, to put their questions in the chat. Um, and looking forward to uh, this discussion. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to call on uh, Scott Newton uh, to give the first intervention here. And Scott, is the head of the School of Law. He is the chair of the SOAS Center of, Contempor of um, Contemporary Central Asia and Caucasus. His research interests encompass post-Soviet, post-colonial Eurasian legal uh, geographies, post-colonial regulatory and institutional frameworks. And he also works on critical constitutionalism and the allied globalization projects of human rights, rule of law, conflict resolution, and global governance. If I missed anything, Scott, I'm sure you can um, put that in the discussion, but um, welcome. That's more than enough, Tina. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome from an unusually warm and sunny London. It, it's, a, it's a particular pleasure today for me. Um, that's a, a professional pleasure, a personal pleasure, and a, and a political pleasure, all rolled up in one, to, to welcome everyone for an especially auspicious book launch and discussion. The, the focus of the discussion, as Dean has said, will be appropriate enough on the book and its themes on Palestine itself, the land, its people, and the role of al haq and law in affirming the inseparability of the one from the other and contesting the multiple modes and ruses of attempted separation. I want to focus briefly on the author and her relation to the book and her act of writing it an act that is perfectly emblematic of Lynn's signature passion and courage and, and damned persistence, with all of which I have now been acquainted for more than two decades. Um, when, when I first fetched up here at SOAS in 1999, Lynn was one of the very most welcoming colleagues and the impression she made on me then has only deepened with time and my admiration and respect have only grown since. Lynn is the very best of SOAS, equal parts scholar and activist, activist, student of change, an agent of change, critic of law, and wielder of law. She earned her scholarly credentials at SOAS as a PhD student, and she has burnished them ever brighter across the intervening years as a SOAS scholar. Whilst the struggle for rights and justice in Palestine has been understandably her spiritual and intellectual lodestar, she has been pulled in other directions by her fundamental commitment to human rights as well, as far as Rwanda and Haiti. And that commitment she has made manifest in all sorts of ways here at SOAS, from her Islamic family law articles and books, her honor crimes project, 
to her amazing human rights clinic, which is one of the very luckiest tickets our, our post student grad students can draw. So the work we have come here today to herald and to honor is maktub, a, a writing, a writing down of epical events and extraordinary people and compelling ideas and novel practices, but, it, but it's also maktub in the figurative sense, i.e. ordained, destined. So Lynn's writing down of the story of al Hawk, which is an amazing, amazing story. Her act of writing was itself written, maktub. Lynn was made to write this book and no one but she could have done it as witness, as participant, as chronicler, as analyst. The book itself is a meticulous, profoundly informed and profoundly humane account, a kind of organizational biography of al Hawk, or if you will permit, as I first said to Lynn some weeks back, a hockeyography. It's, it's as full of anecdote and incident as it is of argument and analysis. It's just studded with gems. The story of Raja's little pamphlet, um, the West Bank and the Rule of Law, for instance, or the saga of the enforcement project and the incorporation of IHL in the work of Bell Hawk in the wake of the first intifada. Each of these episodes is as rich in drama and human interest as it is in scholarly critique. It's a testament to sumud of different sorts. The sumud of lawyers is a distinctive kind manifest in a particular professional kind of diligence and detail and dedication. And the sumud of human rights lawyers in the context of occupation in the teeth of determined, defiant and diabolically clever adversaries and authorities is even more so. And when you join this kind of professional sumud to the kind of ethical, political and cultural sumud that Palestinians have so admirably cultivated for these many decades, what you get is something categorically distinct, which al Hoq has made its trademark, an altogether singular patience, tenacity, and persistence over the long durée. And as long as I'm talking about the varieties of Sumud, the Sumud of Lynn Welshman deserves special mention and special honor. <laughs> because when you compound the Sumud of lawyers and the Sumud of human rights lawyers in particular with the Sumud of Palestinians, and then the Samud of Lynn Welshman as rigorous scholar historian, well, then you have something overpowering, something that simply was meant to be something maktub. Congratulations, Lynn. And congratulations, Raja. And congratulations, Shaban. Um, thank you, Scott. That was pretty, uh, pretty impressive. And it does tell us about uh, Lynn and her work and her tenacity. I think it does deserve mention. Um, I'm, I'm going to call uh, uh, Bishara now, and I forgot to say in the introduction that Bishara played a big role in this because he is the editor of the book series that uh, published, uh, you know, that kind of uh, published this book as part of the series, new series on new directions of Palestine studies. Um, and so that is a double kind of um, um, accolade or uh, that you can have uh, Bishara before I introduce you. Uh, Bishara is the inaugural Mahmoud Darwish Professor of Palestinian Studies, the first chair of its kind dedicated to this field of study at Brown University in the US. He is the founding director of Brown Center for Middle East Studies and founder of New Directions for Palestinian Studies, a CMES initiative since 2012. His research focuses on groups, places, and time periods marginalized by mainstream scholarship on the early modern and modern Middle East, with a focus on the social, economic, and legal history of, Eastern, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. He is the editor of the book series on Palestinian studies published by the University of California Press and co-editor of the Jerusalem Quarterly, among many other um, kind of hats that he wears and um, different hats that he wears at different times. I have uh, I had the pleasure of meeting you at uh, Mesa and also uh, of reading your work and particularly your your history, history books, his history, his geographies. If I don't mention it properly, it's uh, it's being Palestinian. You are you are allowed to make mistakes in pronunciation. Um, but anyway, Bishara, welcome. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Dina. Um, honored to be here. Um, 
I also want to thank um, Barbara Overketter at the Brown side who helped to organize this. And of course, Nadia Ali, who is familiar to most of you, uh, who is now the director of Middle East Studies at Brown University. Um, I met Lynn in the early 80s in Batn al Hawa, I think it was, where she lived uh, in Ramallah. And uh, I'm so glad that our paths have crossed over the years, and especially now this book um, in many ways had its genesis back in those days of the first intifada, I'm sorry, that preceded the first intifada by almost a decade. So um, I think book launches are wonderful. They're poignant events because often what brings us to write books are very painful and uh, sometimes insurmountable challenges that we're facing. And we decide to sort of contribute. <laughs> and that leads us to write the books that we do. And especially in the case of Lynn here, uh, especially appropriate. Um, but they're also wonderful events to celebrate the fact that this is a often a collective effort. And what Br Lynn has done beyond writing the book is give expression or articulate a larger family and network uh, that has developed over the years. And um, uh, being part of that family and network is, is really important considering the challenges that lie ahead. So thank you, Lynn, for bringing us together and for writing this book. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say two quick words about where I think this book fits in the larger field of Palestinian studies. and. Um, what are some of the political intellectual stakes that led us to publish it in the New Directions in Palestinian Studies uh, book series uh, that Dina mentioned. And I hear I want to emphasize uh, as my, by way of opening this uh, point that it's called Palestinian Studies, not Palestine Studies. And that's very important, I think, because uh, it opens up a much larger intellectual and political space for reinventing the political vocabulary that, that we've inherited and that we must change. Um, so in a 1995 interview, the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish said, quote, Palestinian poetry has for less than a decade become conscious of the necessity of humanizing its themes and passing from Palestine as a topic or an object to Palestinian as subject. I think this entelage ontological shift in poetry also holds true for shifts in the political imagination and in institution building and in knowledge production. Law uh, in the service of man, later known as al-Haq, which was established in 1979 as the first Palestinian human rights organization is a prime example. The change in focus from Palestine to Palestinian is evident in the name itself, man. Writ large, of course, uh, <clears throat> but I should say heteronormative <laughs> nevertheless, man became the subject on three levels. The individual, the collective, that is to say the Palestinians as a political community, and the human as universal citizens with inalienable rights. Now Al-Haq's founders dared to imagine or reimagine politics by initially taking a quote unquote non-political stance in defense of quote unquote the rule of law. This in itself is not highly unusual until one is reminded that they did so in the context of a dominant nationalist political culture that saw itself as leading the struggle against a settler colonial project which steals Palestinian lands and builds Israeli Jewish colonies while incarcerating Palestinians and brutally repressing them. And this is of course an ongoing struggle. As the first Palestinian organization of its kind and one of the earliest in the Middle East and the world, Al-Haq had an outsized influence locally, regionally, and internationally in terms of its innovative forms of self-governance and methods of data collection, seasoned by working under very difficult long-term conditions of foreign military rule. In his reports and published self-reflections, Al-Haq produced insightful forms of knowledge about the external pressures on and internal contradictions of the Palestinian condition. The rise and inevitable crises experienced by Al-Haq, especially after the 1993 Oslo Accords, 
have profound lessons to teach all of us about the forms of political mobilization that are opened and foreclosed by human rights frameworks and about how the Palestinian experience enriches our understanding of larger global trends and the struggle for justice, equality, and freedom. So what Lynn has done by, is to look at the world through the eyes of Palestinian legal activists. Her book contributes to New Directions in Palestinian Studies uh, book series, because among other things, the book series seeks to rigorous works of scholarship that center the Palestinian experience, introduce new narratives and actors, and utilize locally generated vernacular sources. So NDPS values in many ways, justice-centered academic works that at the same time do not shy away from critical analysis of internal problems and contradictions. And one of the most important dimensions of Lynn's book is her judicious and honest account of the conflicts, political, personal, institutional, ideological, which rocked Al-Haq, especially after the tragedy of the Oslo Accords and the failures of the Palestinian Authority started to come into full view. In hindsight, these conflicts were inevitable, considering the historical moment of Al-Haq's formation, which straddled third-worldist anti-colonial worldviews uh, what you might, might call the Bandung, uh, Bandung moment of the 50s and the 60s, they were concerned with social, economic decolonization or development as they called it. Uh, <clears throat> that's on the one hand, but coming down the horizons on the other was a different uh, moment. That is the moment of a universalist liberal conceptual vocabulary concerned with international law and human rights, often in reaction to the fact that these decolonizing projects, especially in the Nasser era, sought to make major structural changes but at the expense of human rights and personal freedoms. So Welshman's book in many ways offers a prehistory of human rights work that globalizes the Palestinian experience. I uh, <clears throat> want to thank Lynn really for one more thing, and that is the integrity, the integrity that one feels in the book itself, in every line, in every phrase, in every word. Uh, they don't make them like this anymore, Lynn. <laughs> uh, and I really, really appreciate the fact that it was you who put together this overview of a fight, a struggle, an institution, and a politics that has changed over the years and that has a lot to teach us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bashar. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I forgot to say the most important thing, which is Raja Shadi and <laughs> Penny Johnson, we were talking one day and they said, uh, you know, Lynn is doing this book, it's done, she's going with another publisher, maybe you want to take a look at it and talk to her. And of course, within 24 hours, <laughs> uh, I was able to poach that book away <laughs> from the other publisher. <laughs> and thank you, Lynn, for allowing that to happen. And thank you, Raja and, and, and Penny for, for uh, uh, letting me know. Um, thank you, Bashara. And we come now to uh, Sharwan, who, who played a major role in, in this book and also in Al Haq. Uh, Sharwan is the Palestinian, probably the, the, the Palestinian subject that uh, Bishara was talking about, you know, kind of thinking of uh, Palestinians and what they do as subjects uh, of, you know, of different experiences and having lived through different experiences. But uh, Sharwan Jabaril is a Palestinian human rights defender who has been the general director of Al Haq since 2006, after first joining it in 1987 as a field worker. He has served as a commissioner for the IJC, member for the Human Rights um, Watch Middle East Advisory Board, been elected as vice president and then president of the International Federation of Human Rights Leagues and is the recipient of many distinguished awards for his human rights work. The first being the Reebok Human Rights Awards for Young Human Rights Defenders in 1990. Where do you close it? 
His reflections and interventions have been widely published, including in Foreign Policy, Open Democracy, and The Independent. Um, so, uh, Charwan, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to hearing of your uh, intervention here and your work, of course. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dina, and thank you for the Center for Palestine Studies and Suez. Let me first uh, thank you all for organizing this special event and uh, congratulate my dear friend uh, Lynn Welshman for the extraordinary effort she has paid to write this book that is dedicated to al haq the first human rights organization in the Middle East. Uh, when we add North Africa, we will become part of the uh, first organizations. But in Middle East, we are the first human rights organization. Today, it uh, honors me you know, to, to be with you, to participate and uh, celebrate the launching of this very important book that is written by the committed and dedicated colleague and supple human rights defenders who succeeded in describing the process of the organization in an objective and professional manner. This book means a lot to me and to all of us. We have been waiting for it <coughs> for a time and today it's between our hands. When speaking about Lynn and al uh, my testimony might be invalid as I am the general director of the organization. However, I will try to be as objective as possible before I share with you some lessons we have learned throughout the long building process of Al-Haq. I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to the founders of Al-Haq, especially Mr. Roger Shada, uh, who was the first person to stand behind the establishment of the organization. Also, I would like to thank all early staff of the organization, as well as its present and previous staff and volunteers and board and general assembly members who have given a lot to the organization through this, their work and their strong position. Here I mentioned with gratitude my dear colleague, Emma Playfer. Too many people have worked for a hack. If we look at the long process of the organization, we will see that it has passed through different but connected phases and stations. Persons we have worked during this period have made us use of the experience of the people who preceded them in a creative manner. The experiences are not necessarily positive in their entirety, but people learned from all of these experiences to build an organization that keeps developing and growing like a living creature. This has made the name of Al Haq in the front in the forefront, irrespective of the persons who work for it. One of the things that has contributed to the success of the organization in its impartiality, professionality, and non-partisan nature, Al-Haq does not belong to any political party. It does it work based on the internationally recognized human rights values and the principles in which it deeply believes. The organization tends to have people from the, gener uh, the uh, generations working for it. You will always see old, middle-aged, and young people in the organization. This has protected the organization from aging and being traditional in its approach and opened wide the door for innovation and the creativity at various levels. When al haq started to use the colonialism and apartheid frameworks to describe the case in Palestine many years ago, some believe that we should be more careful in what we say and write. Today, there is a consensus among the human rights community at the international that <coughs> level that our perspective is correct and that what is happening in Palestine is settler colonial regime and the practices and apartheid. Al-Haq is functioning in a very complex context and environment where international law has lost much of its value 
uh, due to the absence of political will to hold perpetrators of international crimes accountable. This makes our mission even more complex as we need to double our effort to convince people, especially the young generations, of the visibility of the system that has failed so far in bringing justice to them and enable them to enjoy their individual and collective rights. I don't want to go through the first intifada and what we had at that time, <clears throat> but I would like, in spite of all of this, Al-Haq has maintained its respected, uh, respected status among people because of its professionality, transparency, and impartiality. Lynn's book focuses on a phase of Al-Haq's life when half of the third or, or third or one third of the staff were internationals. Al-Haq has always welcomed and encouraged international to contribute to the work of the organization and learn from its experience. Today, and as a result of the Israeli policies and harassment, internationals can join Al-Haq easily. Only three staff members are internationals these days, and all of them, they are outside of the country. They are working online. The organization has been the subject of orchestrated Israeli campaign to silence its voice through different means, including by defamation and drying of financial resources. However, I assure you that Al-Haq will continue to do the work it believes in and that Israeli oppression and campaigns will not prevent us from doing our work. What makes us optimistic is the hope in the new generations that have started to make change at the international level. Therefore, I would suggest that the present book be the first book and the preparations start for the second book as there are many things that need to be said and documented about the process of Al-Haq's life. Lens has to be ready for, uh, for that. Finally, let me say again, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Bishara. Thank you, Dina. And thanks to you all. We will never give up hope that justice will prevail. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sharwan. And we'll probably have loads of questions for you. So we come to Raja. Um, nice to see you again, Raja. Uh, nice to see you. Pal yeah, Palestinian lawyer and writer who lives in Ramallah, very well known, obviously. Um, he co-founded Al-Haq in 1979 and shared the leadership of the organization until the early 1990s. He was lead author of Al-Haq's first groundbreaking publication, The West Bank and the Rule of Law in 1980 and published significant works on international law, the Israeli occupation and Palestinian rights. He was legal advisor to the Palestinian delegation um, to the Madrid and Washington talks that followed the first intifada. He is also the author of highly acclaimed memoirs and diaries and has contributed reflections to the London Review of uh, Books, The New Yorker, The Guardian, among others. His book, Palestinian Walks, uh, won the Orwell Prize for political writing in 2008. And it's just a wonderful read, uh, which really takes you um, to the land as it should. Uh, so thank you for that, Raja, but looking forward to your intervention today. Thank you, Dina. I, I want to thank all the other speakers, but I want to reserve my main thanks for Lynn, for her outstanding scholarship and the meticulous care in which she narrated the Haq story truthfully, critically, and thoroughly. Her book tells the story of how a fledgling pioneering organization managed to be established and survived in one of the most complicated and critical places in the world in which to work on promoting and protecting human rights. It's a story that Lynn manages to tell with such passion and vividness that it makes for exciting reading. I would like to point out that the Haq's uniqueness among Palestinian public institutions is that all communications were in writing, documented and archived. And this made it possible for Lynn to carry out this comprehensive study of the organization. In this short talk, I will try and provide a selective history of the use of law as an instrument of struggle and as a means of resistance against Israeli aggression. 
everything I still say, allude to here, is discussed at length in Lin's excellent and exhaustive work. In fact, reading Lin's work reminded me of so much of that history that I had forgotten. Al-Haq's establishment came at propitious time. It was 12 years after the start of the Israeli occupation. There was then a total absence of legal challenge to the occupation. There were also no human rights organization, organizations in the occupied territory. What made matters worse was that shortly after the Israeli occupation on 5 June 1967, the entire judiciary and lawyers in the West Bank decided to go on strike, which incidentally came to be the longest lawyer strike in history, lasting for over three decades. The strike meant that the Palestinian lawyers abandoned the legal struggle against the occupation. The first obstacle faced by the founders of the new project of establishing this first human rights organization was how to register. The occupation had taken over the power to register NGOs. I still remember the heated arguments we had with veteran lawyers who were adamant that the company's law, the local company's law, does not allow the registration of not-for-profit companies. But we held our ground and managed to get the organization registered as a company. This marked our first success and first creative use of the law. All this is described at length in Lynn's excellent book. One of the good fortunes of the is that the International Commission of Jury Geneva was headed by a progressive, courageous man, Neil McDermott, who at that early time, the end of the 70s, was the only leader of, the human, of a human rights organization willing to support a Palestinian organization like al Haq, critical of Israel. For, his, for this support, he had to fight constant battles with his board who were persistently trying to hold him back. Neil was a great mentor who guided us in our work and al Haq owes him a lot. He was willing to stand by us publicly, which at the time was no mean feat. He was only, he not only agreed to allow the affiliation of al Haq with the ICJ, but also co-published the organization's first publication, The West Bank and the Rule of Law. This was a modest book, and here it is, if, if you can see it. It's a modest book, but at that time, one of great significance. It shed light on how Israel was using secret legislation to bring about changes in the law of the occupied territories. This is what Neil wrote in the preface to the book. There have been isolated cases, as in Chile, where one or two decrees of military government have been treated as secret documents and not published. However, this is the first case to come to the attention of the International Commission of Jurists, where the entire legislation of a territory is not published in an official gazette available to the general public." Unquote. The small publication put Al-Haq, which was then LSM, Law in the Service of Man, on the map and drew a blueprint of its future work which consisted of adding flesh to the bones, to the structure described in the book through more detailed studies on specific topics. Thus, was done, this, thus more was done on the land expropriations, settlements, land use planning, and settler violence, among other subjects. The reluctance of the major Western human rights organizations to speak out made our work at Al Haq all the more important and risky. Thus, Al Haq, for example, was the first to call what was taking place in Israeli prisons torture, when at the time, Amnesty International, for example, only described it as mistreatment. Al Haq was taking risks by daring to call a spade a spade. The great disappointment to all of us at Al Haq came a decade later, when Al Haq's counsel was not sought neither in the drafting of the terms of reference of the negotiations between Israel and the PLO, nor later in drafting what emerged as the Oslo Accords of 1993-95. The resulting accord consolidated 
rather than did away with these military orders that Al-Haq had analyzed in, previous, in various publications. And in this way, keeping it all in, play, all in place, all the legal settlements and the means at Israel's disposal to create new ones. At present, international standing and increased means available to the organization enables it to manage larger challenges than has been the case in the past. Most important of these is in helping the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court at The Hague to prepare the case against Israel for war crimes. And perhaps Shawan, the present director, can tell us more about what is happening in this regard. Several decades after its establishment, the organization has much work to do. The future is likely to be of more settler violence and aggression, whether on Al-Aqsa or on the Palestinian communities in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. My own great apprehension, which I've already written about, is of an attempted mass expulsion of Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank by armed settlers strategically situated as they are on high grounds more, around most Palestinian cities and villages. They are driven by an ideology that Jerusalem and the West Bank are theirs alone, holy lands given to them by the Almighty. Should such ethnic cleansing take place, Al-Haq would be there to ring the alarm bell and hopefully avert the surreptitious attempt by these criminal violent settlers to perpetrate a repeat performance of 1948 Nakbi. Let us hope it doesn't come to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raja. And that raises a lot of questions around the present and uh, what is happening right now. Um, and now Lisa. Uh, Lisa Hajar is a sociologist who focuses on law and conflict, human rights, political violence, and contemporary international affairs. Her work is interdisciplinary and contributes to multiple fields in the social sciences and humanities, including Middle East studies, American studies, law and society. Her current research focuses primarily on the US war on terror, particularly around the issues of torture, targeted uh, killing, and Guant Guantanamo. She also focuses on human rights in the Arab world. Her journalistic writings have been published in The Nation, Al Jazeera English, Middle East Report, and Jadalia. But there's so much more to Lisa that uh, I don't have time to talk about now. Um, but I'm really looking forward to uh, what you have to say. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really grateful to be a part of this very august group. And by the way, um, somebody just posted my Twitter handle. I only use Twitter when I'm in Guantanamo, but you can still follow me. <laughs> so I would talk to <clears throat> call my comments today uh, or title them The World That Al Haq Made. As I was leading, reading uh, Lynn Welshman's rich and unsparing history of Al Haq, I was struck by a line on page 149, which begins, quote, back in the early 80s when Shahada still believed in the power of law. And it continues. This line, embedded in the middle of the book, <clears throat> encapsulates one of the core paradoxes of this organization, specifically legal work on behalf of Palestinians' rights generally and human rights activism globally. If the criteria for judging the value of human rights work was whether it stopped or even reduced Israeli human rights violations and deterred Israeli war crimes, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> then empirical reality would uh, demand a finding that the law did not work. It did not set Palestinians free, did not protect them, did not punish those who harmed, killed, or oppressed them. Lori Allen has written a whole book about disappointment and dashed hopes, uh, which she aptly titled The Rise and Fall of Human Rights, Cynicism and Politics in Occupied Palestine. Such skepticism about the efficacy of law and human rights activism is not unique to Palestine. And Lynn writes about it sort of brilliantly and critically. It can be found almost everywhere lawyers try to enforce the law to protect the rights of discriminated and disenfranchised groups against recalcitrant and illiberal states. Stuart Scheingold, in his seminal book, The Politics of Rights, characterizes the investment of time and hope in litigation and other law-based strategies as, quote, the myth of rights. So Scheingold writes, the myth of rights is premised on a direct linking of litigation rights and remedies with social change, which he characterizes as naive in extremists. 
Shine's Gold's point is that law can vindicate rights only when and if there is political support for the goals of legal work. So I'm gonna explain why I regard Shine Gold's contention that politics should come first as naive and extremist, and why the global history of al Haq um, that Lynn Welshman's book documents supports this critique. But first, let's think about the paradoxical significance of that phrase I mentioned above, still believed. Shahadeh and other members of the triumvirate, that's Jonathan Kutab and um, Charles Shamas, who formed al Haq, certainly believed in the power of law when they started, as evidenced by the fact that they named their organization Law in the Service of Man, and they envisioned their work as doing law, not politics. So just to illuminate something, there's a passage on page 55 in which Welshman is writing about a 1980 entry in Raja Shahada's journal. And the topic is the decision back in 1980 by Palestinian lawyers to mount a legal challenge to the deportation of two West Bank mayors before the Israeli high court. So quoting uh, Welshman, Shahadi's father Aziz was preparing one affidavit to the high court on the fourth Geneva Convention's prohibition of deportation and another on the illegality of deportation under the Jordanian constitution and the status of the British issued defense emergency regulations of 1945 under which the orders had been made. Shahadi reported wild hope amongst many and wrote that even the political diehards who say we should never appeal to or recognize any Israeli institution are excited. At the end of his journal, Shahadi records hopes crushed when the high court declined to recommend the repeal of the deportation orders, end quote. So hopes crushed by the loss of a court case is the quintessential manifestation of thinking like a lawyer. But there's an analytical alternative that involves not thinking like a lawyer. Indeed, one of the great merits of Welshman's book is that she contextualizes the work of lawyers and the legalistic contributions of al Haq without judging them as a lawyer would in terms of wins and losses. In terms of al Haq's main goals, defending the rule of law, championing justice and rights for Palestinians, advocating legal accountability for law violators, and pursuing international protection against gross crimes, the record of losses and defeats was almost unbroken. But let's examine al Haq's record, as Wilshman does, through a global lens. al Haq changed the world, or to put it another way, we live in the world <clears throat> that al Haq made. Al Haq, along with the Gaza Center for Rights and Law, which was later renamed the Palestine Center for Human Rights, pioneered the use of international humanitarian law as a cudgel to expose, criticize, condemn, and most importantly, to explain to the world the illegalities and illegitimate nature of Israeli rule in the occupied territories. That work chipped away at Israel's false narrative that the state was ruling Palestinians legally and exercising legitimate prerogatives to confiscate Palestinian land, to settle Jewish citizens in the occupied territories, to rely on coercive interrogation techniques as a security imperative, and so on. al Haq set a course that many other human rights lawyers and activists have followed and adapted in their own contexts judging a powerful state against the standards of law and stripping the state of a monopoly over the interpretation of law. Today, many human rights and justice activists the world over can speak authoritatively about IHL violations and the consequences that should result because of the examples set by al Haq. At the turn of the 21st century, al Haq and PCHR invested their monitoring and analyzing skill sets in the business of accountability through international criminal law enforcement. If we were to think about the results of these efforts like a lawyer, we could bemoan the fact that to date, no Israeli war cr um, criminals have been indicted in any court system. But contrary to the Shine Goldian admonition that law can't work without strong political support, this accountability work itself despite the lack of wins, is altering global narratives about Israel and Palestine. And in that regard, legal activism is affecting the political terrain, albeit in ways the out whose outcomes are hard to predict. The US-based Center for Constitutional Rights, which has undertaken a number of projects and cases to defend Palestinian rights, has a slogan for this, success without victory. 
So Welshman's epilogue is a catalog of successes without victory. For example, she describes the unhappy fallout of the UN Goldstone Commission report as the impetus for al haq and other Palestinian human rights organizations to activate more direct Palestinian access to the International Criminal Court. By the end of 2017, al haq PCHR, along with Al-Mazan and Al-Adamir, had submitted five substantive communications to the ICC prosecutor in The Hague, supporting allegations of particular war crimes and crimes against humanity, which could be attributed to specific high-level Israeli military and civilian officials. One of these, which focused on the West Bank at including East Jerusalem, presented evidence of the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. As Welshman writes, quote, it is in giving the lie to official Israeli self images of justice and the rule of law as the basis of its governance, as well as holding the Palestinian authorities to account, that current Palestinian human rights work, albeit in a much more complex circumstances, most closely evokes the impetus that established al haq in the late 1970s. So al haqs work deserves some of the credit for the fact that Israeli apartheid now slips easily off the tongue and has become a focus for new generations of activists in support of Palestinian rights. Official Israeli hysteria over this framing is an example of success without victory. So to conclude my argument about a world that al haq made, I would just draw your attention to a quote that Lynn cites um, from 2016 by Shawan Jabarin, and quoting, Palestine in its legal and jurisprudential aspects is a test for the whole system of international law. And I heartily agree with that. Thank you, Lynn, for writing this book. Thank you, Lisa. That was great um, and, and raises many questions. And, and finally, we come to Lynn. Uh, to give her comments and her responses. Uh, Lynn Welshman is professor of law in the Middle East and North Africa at the Sua School of Law and founder of the International Human Rights Clinic. She has published widely uh, on areas including family law, Islamic law, women's rights, and human rights in the Arab world. She is a member of the Open Society Foundation's MENA Office Advisory Board and of the board of the Euro Mediterranean Foundation for the Support of Human Rights Defenders. She worked with Al-Haq for different periods and in different capacities from the early 1980s and is the author of the book that we are launching uh, today. Uh, Lynn, welcome and thank, thank you. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. And I've got a video. Thank you, um, everybody. I sort of had to wait a bit to think what... Oh, well, so first of all, thanks to everybody. Thank you, Dina, for supporting this uh, and uh, helping to organize it and Aki for doing physicalities of it. Scott, thank you for your words. I didn't know you knew so much about me. It's a little worrying, but, but that's <laughs> very nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, you thought so much. Thank you. Bishara for the publishing. It was wonderful. I was in Ramallah and I was at an Al-Haq 40th anniversary. Remember that Al-Haq asked me to write this book for its 30th anniversary. So I am back on the 40th and the next day I get a call from Bishara in Nablus, who I met in Batal Hawa in 1984, whatever it was, saying, hey, you know, have you thought about, and it's very nice, and to be fair, Bishara, the other publisher would have been Dina, uh, the IB Tourist, the, the Palestine Centre at SOAS publisher, and she very generously with Adam agreed to um that to, to, to that it should go with with you with your with your press with your new series which is i think i am ethically i think it's a it's, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to contribute to your goal of decolonizing knowledge production about the Palestinian situation and i think it's really where the book belongs and the fact that it's free to download to anybody across the world is exactly where academia needs to be and exactly where we need to be thinking about putting that knowledge out there so i'm really very grateful that your center made that happen um yeah uh lisa your work as you will have seen i hope was seminal to many of my arguments so i'm very very proud that you agreed to join this and we also met in the 80s in Ramallah. Um, if you remember, if you know Ramallah, that was number eight, yeah. Um, and Raja, as a friend and a mentor, and one of the co-founders of Al-Haq with Jonathan Kuteb and Charles Shemes. Um, Raja, you've always been a model and an inspiration and really rather daunting until one realizes that you, you don't mean to do that. And then when you realize you don't mean to be daunting, it sort of just becomes inspirational. Um, I'm not, I'm just saying it, can be quite daunting because 
of the concentration you bring to thinking about things. And that's partly what I'm going to talk about in just, in just one minute. Now, when the next volume should be ready by Christmas, but I'm not going to guarantee delivery just at the moment until we've agreed what you wanted to cover, okay? And I won't tell you which Christmas, probably, for the moment. Um, but thank you for inviting me to write it. And thank you for your friendship over the years. And thank you for not giving me as hard a time as you were entitled to do um, for the constant delays. It was a much harder book to write than I thought it would be. And Bishara, I appreciated your words at the start about how when you pick a project, it can sometimes bring things that you didn't expect it to bring and it can be more, more difficult than you thought. So that's me making excuses. I already apologized in my 2013 professorial inaugural lecture for being late with book, and that was seven years ago now. I, so anyway, there you go, Shao Wen. Thank you for your friendship and for keeping up with it. Um, and finally, I would have to say thank you to Al Haq. The book dedication is to Al Haq, um, particularly to everybody, former staffers, present staffers, well, future staffers, but they didn't talk to me, um, uh, who talked to me about the book. It really, the book became a collective endeavor. I was, you know, I, I did have people contacting me when they heard it was being writing and so on, and it became, I felt like I was sort of, a, well, to a certain extent, of course, it's my, 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 my responsibility for how I interpreted it, but I was a bit of a repository for a lot of these stories. And part of what I want to say about that is that some of the things we talked about, well, you talked about Bashar, you alluded to some of the difficult times Al Haq had was, as a former staffer told me, precisely because Al Haq meant so much and means so much to people, because it meant so much and means so much, is why those tensions happened, along with the political background and why people kept wanting to talk about it, about particular episodes, particular uh, times, and so on. Um, and I think that's probably inevitable, but it's also indicative of um, one thing I wanted to talk about the idea that the best work, well, certainly a lot of the best work in the world comes out of collective endeavor. It comes out of sitting around with a group of people who trust each other, who have an agreed on aim, not necessarily agreed on how to get there, but then and in the case of Palestinian human rights groups, and I suppose, well, I'm sure human rights groups elsewhere, but what I learned from al Haq as soon as I went to Palestine was that when you're in the face of apparently insurmountable odds, insurmountable obstacles, and uh, uh, in, you know, odds that you can't even start counting, it is absolutely imperative that you still come up with an idea. You have to have an idea about how you're going to meet those odds, how you're going to beat those odds. This is the thing about exactly about um, uh, about what but what uh, what uh, Lisa was saying, and I think that idea of sparking off in a group. Uh, worked very well, as I said in the book, for, with a hat for many, for many, for many years, and I think it still does inspire the idea that if you can get a collective around a table and bang, as we know, bang your ideas around, it comes out with much more than the sum of your parts, and that's ultimately what Al Haq was, and what I still think it is, because now we see Al Haq working much more closely with a wider range. Of course, there's more human rights organisations, and there's this groundbreaking work at the ICC, which has been a massively difficult struggle and a massively long haul. And again, that's about the persistence of saying, I will get up tomorrow and do it again. You know, and I, we will sit together and have another idea and we will do it again. Is, is something, the courage of that is something that I learned for the first time when I went in 1982 and met Al Haq in 1983, LSM as it was then, and has inspired me ever since. It's interesting what you said, Shawan, about there having been more non-Palestinian staffers there, because the ones also, many of them got in touch about this book. And I think for all of us non-Palestinian staffs who came, it, 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 it was such, um, such a glowing time in our lives. It was so full of energy, momentum and dynamism that I think it spurred people on and inspired us all in many, many ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, that other people can't, other, I mean, non-Palestinian staff, but, but I'm sure that Palestinian staffers are still getting that. And that's sort of the idea of being able to keep that, I suppose to me, what it was, was seeing human rights being done in the daily grind, day after day after day, just doing it, you know? And also as al Haq management did, and does trying to do it in a participatory way, especially in the you know in the early years, in a way that implemented human rights um, uh, between 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 people. Um, 
And we must remember that Al Haq from the very beginning was also, Al Haq from the beginning was trying to also look at human rights in Palestinian society. Its beginning was very, and it kept saying, that's the other thing, you know, there was always this reflection. So Ahak is really busy, LSM, 1986, everything's happening. And they keep publishing these long reflective points about who are we? Why are we doing, <laughs> why are we doing this? Um, it's almost like, why are you writing this? You know, because <laughs> it's taking time. But all this was coming out of these meetings, general meetings that where people were knocking these and, and coming to an agreement, a consensus, building themselves through building the organization of what it means to do human rights under uh, occupation. And that, of course, builds into discussions on, like you see the first three reports that al Haq did in the annual reports in the first intifada, they were amazing gatherings of, of just amazing field work, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, underlying analyses, and the analyses were talking about what areas of law can we use, what applies and what doesn't, and sort of it's not a straightforward human rights report, it never was, it was always much more. It's extraordinary work. Um, and you know things like the representation to state parties. You can see reflections of that from 1990 in the in the tenth emergency session from 2017 or 18. When using the same wording, it's very very interesting. Um, I mean, in some ways, you can say yes, it's a problem because it keeps coming back because it hasn't been done. But it means that having the idea of what might be useful and still coming back to it um, is 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 uh, is another legacy that Al Haq is still living. And the ICC work, I think, is testament to really, really massively hard work and to the thing that Al Haq has done, which everybody pays testament to, which is this the methodology of its documentation and evidence. It's two things. It's first of all saying that everything had to be evidenced and how you collect evidence and how you work with your community and communities to collect the evidence. This is the field research, absolutely central to Al Haq. Huh? And then so at the beginning of the first intifada, there's a bit of a spat because the Palestinian, um, the, the, the Jerusalem Palestinian Center was a bit cross because Al Haq wouldn't say anything about what was going on in Gaza because at the time they didn't have field workers in Gaza. Sort of a classic sort of, we can't say it because we haven't documented itself. I mean, they got over that when they had field workers in Gaza quite soon. But um, that idea of having evidence from the ground informing everything and also informing what Al Haq looked at. So it wasn't a top down, we should look at this, we should find evidence. That we, it was anyway, and, and uh, that, that you can see coming out of the reports very important mapping not only the violations but also that and then then having all that information and saying so what do we do with it so part of what you do with it is you do what's happening elsewhere in the world a bit but another getting another area of policy and voice directly involved was the database development this is things people don't think about but actually being involved in a growing idea of how do we document human how do we retrieve the information i have had a major input into saying how we're going to sort out a document retrieval system that serves our needs in the West Bank, in Gaza, wherever. Not, we're not going to accept a system that doesn't actually work for us. We're not doing it for research but we're doing it for how we need to find our information. Absolutely stunning work. And one more thing I have to check as well is, of course, the library. I mean, who would think you start up a human rights position? One of the first things you do is say, oh, we've got to have a library. Well, not everybody think you have to have a library, but this is the idea of having sources of building. And of course, the idea was as a public library, so people could come, Palestinians could come from the community, school students, university students, you know, and learn about human rights law. Now, it's an extraordinary thought to do it at that time. So, yeah, and Al Haq, of course, now does training and methodology. It's in, it's involved in database development, all sorts of international levels. All these things which Al Haq is continuing are things that come from ideas that know that oh, oh, we can ask Shawan to talk for the next hour, actually talk about new ideas, Shawan, you're having at Al Haq now, and, um, you know, uh, where those might go, because laying the basis of rigor, I mean, this is one of the things, um, of course, I learned Al Haq, and everybody learns Al Haq, and the field researchers who would tell me about this would say the same thing, and Mu'ayn Rabbani, I recount this anecdote that he said, Mu'ayn Rabbani, who's now in the Ancestral Crisis Group, and works for Al Haq in the early 1990s, first intifada. And he said, you know, he's a very accomplished researcher now in his own right and so on. And he said, um, you know, I still, I still, if I publish something, I go to bed and wake up in a sweat, but I think I've got a footnote wrong. <laughs> and this is, he blames it entirely on Al-Haq, or credits it to Al-Haq, if you like. 
So that and the field researchers that I talked to all talked about that being drilled into them and how the, the coordinators of the field works unit and how their work fed into development of what the organization was doing. This is, these are things that are not the obvious part of the product, if you like, of a human rights organization. And they, they need to be, I think, um, foregrounded, especially now that Shawan, well, al Hop and PCHR and Al Mizan and Al Damir and uh, are, are doing this work at the at the at the ICC, which requires a particular type of coordination, a particular type of evidence collection, and is particularly sensitive, as somebody has already said, for the Israeli authorities, who uh, are extremely um, uh, clearly uh, unsettled by it, to say the least. So. How LSM and Al Haq have inserted the Palestinian voice directly, also by saying, we will have our say on what humanitarian means. We will try. There was the time in 1980, why should we begin the Intifada? They didn't mean it to be then, when they asked for help, knowing how to ask for help. So they get all these international lawyers and experts and academics to come to Jerusalem in the West Bank, as it turned out at the beginning of the first Intifada. And so these guys, these guys and women are there at the beginning and, and looking at what's going on. And when I was doing the research for this book, the people who were field researchers who were involved in helping them and in getting a read and bringing witnesses and testimonies and all that, they were absolutely adamant that this was such a big collective endeavor. And again, it's one of these things that apparently, according to Emma Playfair, um, whose book, by the way, editing the papers from this conference is a seminal collection for international humanitarian law coming out of this conference, which apparently started by a general meeting where everybody's saying, well, we don't know, does the law mean that? What does it mean you've had an occupation that's lasted this long? This long, at that point, was like 20 years, I think. Um, uh, and Reza said, uh, well, why don't we ask them? Ask people, we'll ask the internet, we'll ask them. And so they, you know, go around and get these people to come. It was a bit before, it was 20 years, and um, have this conference. And it's an extraordinary thing to know also that you need to ask for help and to then go ahead and that then that also becomes something. So I know I'm being a little off, 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 off track here, but I just wanted to salute um, the people focused, if you like, the, the way that everything grew out of groups of people. A small group got a bigger group, a slightly larger group. Now you've got groups across different organizations. I think bearing in mind the momentum and the energy and the the creativity and the brilliance that comes from that human endeavor towards uh, um, a shared goal of justice and dignity is something that we can all um, hold on to. So I want to thank Al Haq for that. Thank, thank you. Does, does anyone want to come in? Uh, Shawan, you wanted to come in and say something in response, uh, or does anyone want to ask any questions of? the co-panelists. Uh, what uh, Lynn said, uh, it's like uh, part of that, it's an emotional thing because you go back also to this long journey. Uh, <clears throat> for me, it's an emotional. Uh, I was from the young generation at that time at al -Hak, And these days when I deal with my colleagues, Always I said to them, I used to be like you. I encourage you to continue on this way or that way. But, but, you know, we add but. I would like to share with you today about a few things, just. Today, you know, the libra uh, librarian, she came to me and she said, there is a new way of dealing with the program of the uh, libraries like for instance, uh, developing a new program called PIP library or something like that for Google. It will become like a centralized one. And I told her, okay, we have to be ready, you know, to develop also our technology, but let's start. Let's, you know, start thinking about all of these things and it brings, you know, all the studies about it, what we will benefit from this, who can benefit. Another thing is they came to me and say that we don't want to print, to publish, let me say, and to print a new box. It has to be also to save papers from one side, save space. And we have to think like, you know, e box or something like that, to publish it online. We can save money, we save play, space, we save everything. I said, yeah, it's good. Let's also think about it. 
Today also I met with a Najah University for the program called Joint Master Program in English, pure in English, about international law. That's, we have been working on this or developing in the last few years, but today they want to start the program jointly with Abhaq. This is part of the daily life. New ideas, developing new things uh, in the field here, there, that's al haq The expectation is high. And sometimes when the expectation is high, it becomes as a burden, you know, or also in your uh, shoulders. My colleagues always, I, every time I said as a director to them, please, please, we have to have like a time to speak to each other, to have, you know, to develop and ideas, don't work on a daily basis. Could you please just reduce the activities you put in the plants? They said, okay, yes. They come with the plan more than the other. Why they feel with the responsibility. This is also an issue, which it means the commitment, the commitment of the, uh, the team. Another thing is the new generation. What's missing these days comparing with it before is the uh, international colleagues. Still, the technology solved the problem. Before, when we were you know, together, uh, dealing, discussing, uh, agree, disagree, this is rich in even the life of al haq in all levels. That's, today, for instance, what we do is virtual uh, things. Virtual is more than before when it comes to meetings. It takes long time keep you, you know, uh, until midnight. That's, that's an issue. Yesterday, for instance, we had a meeting with the, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to say to her, to her, thank you, and to see where we are in our file. I can't share this, you know, virtually, but that's an issue. On a daily basis, there are things. But what's the main challenge before us today? How to deal with the young generation to maintain hope in their minds? This is one main thing. Another thing is, okay, we expanded our programs, you know, to meet also the needs, the main needs, like business and the human rights, like environment, for instance. This is an issue interrelated to the work of Al-Haq. There are many developments. But in the same time, the same line connecting with all of these stations is the commitment and also the transparency. Always, I repeat it, when al haq faced a problem or a crisis or call it what you want, no one touch, one main element is the financial things. The other organization, it was bigger than al haq became bigger than al haq with millions of dollars disappeared for that reasons. Colleagues, you know, they reach the tension between two sides, but no one say any word about, for instance, the transparency of Al-Haq. That's, I think, been taught because of that Al-Haq became also more stronger even than before and continue, continue in its work. May, many, many, I think, uh, lessons, even, you know, there are many lessons in other organizations, I'm sure that. Today, for instance, our relations with universities, we try, for instance, to build, which called the, the center, the center that we did. Uh, a few days ago, we finished the annual uh, summer school. I received also comments and feedbacks from professors outside, from judges from Africa, they participated in summer school. From 27 countries over the world, they participated this time. And we decided to have the summer school twice a year because you know the people from outside, they ask, and they said, maybe this is the first time we understand, we understood the context of Palestine and what's going on uh, there. I think this is one uh, issue. Another thing is the main challenge is how to use also the new techniques, a new technology, even a new way to address also your messages. At the end, you are not media, you are not, but in the same time, things affected your work. How to become more efficient these days? 
that's also one of the main challenge, the main question before us, how to develop, how to digest things, you know, and continue in uh, a new world. Uh, the founders of al haq uh, other colleagues like Lynn, like Emma, like yours, like others, they still as a models also for uh, al haq generation. Every day they uh, read, they find some materials. The last thing is, a few days ago, I had a discussion with the EU uh, about financial uh, things. I told them, we have the financial records and I don't mean by records, the audit report. I mean by records, even the receipts, even handwriting receipt from a grocery or a small shop here or there in this village or that village. We have it since the foundation of al haq which it means no other organization keep, you know, all of these records, I mean hard copies, saving them since 79 until today. And we would like also to uh, digitalize and keep them, you know, and archiving them. That's even each paper. And this is a big and a huge work. It's not easy, but we are doing this. We archived around 80,000 records, 80,000 records, papers, uh, documents here or there in our archiving system. We build it specially for, uh, for that. And we need maybe more than 300, 400,000 other records. You know, this is a big, a big issue. We look at it as a history of the Palestinian people uh, since late 70s until today. And what's coming next is the affidavits that we took from the people. The affidavits that we have a huge number, I think by itself is a story. I encourage Lisa, for instance, if she can think from her own perspective in new ways, for instance, to come to study these things, you know, telling the stories of the people, what's this occupation means. The other thing is today, how we are facing the situation is the division, the uh, internal situation. Uh, we don't know if the uh, authority will continue or not. Uh, the internal uh, explosion maybe is coming. I don't know. Uh, Roger spoke about uh, the other things about expulsion of the people. But I think also internally speaking, uh, I don't know what will happen. Uh, I think we are in a dark moment. We are in the last stage of which called, you know, the, uh, the transitional time. I have been saying that in the last three, four years. I think now we are in the last page and the new things is coming. What's that new things? I don't know what will be shared, you know, but uh, the new generations will uh, take uh, their uh, place now pushing them back and not open the door before them, it means some danger things when you read it, because this is the normal things, normal movement, young generations, they are leading in the street and they are looking to lead also in other places. But the old generation, the others, they are pushing them back and trying to close the door before them. When you close the door before them, you don't know what will happen. We are now in a very critical time, critical time. al haq used to deal with the critical times before, but now we are in this critical time. This is an issue also, and this is a challenge before us. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we start thinking to build, let me say, an analysis and to study some phenomena or trends, social trends, economic trends we haven't studied before. And we call it now, it's like a new, a new way of research. And the new way, we don't mean it to be like the ordinary one we do in legal issues. We are trying to produce, even if it's for internal use, like a research about what's going on, you know, how we can study the situation. This is part of the, the process. 
thank you Lynn uh, again and thank you all again Bishara I think uh, by uh, showing the willing and encouraging you know uh, Lynn also uh, you put again the uh, the train on the track and give a push to the uh, to the train that's a great uh, things but uh, I do believe about the work of uh, Lynn uh, her professionality her precise work detailed uh, research. This is a very important uh, thing and also the analysis that she uh, added to. Uh, because of that, I offer here again, please Lynn, if you have an effort, please come and have also a new book about this experience because many human rights organizations, activists, academics, they will benefit from uh, this work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I think before we make any, any other comments among, among panelists, I'm going to take some questions from the audience, um, which are coming in the chat. Um, and please put your questions in the chat box because we do not have the facility of having, you know, uh, allowing you onto the, onto the panel. But you, you all raised some important questions, which we will come back to at the end. And I was taken by the idea of the myth of rights um, as a Palestinian myself. And that is a challenge to Lisa later on. Uh, but one of the questions here, the first one from Wissam Ahmad says, uh, what, how important do you think for Al-Haq to push for the evolution of international law? specifically with the regard to the prohibition of colonialism as a peremptory norm of general international law. Perhaps to solve the question of Palestine, we have also to eradicate colonialism from the earth and free people uh, of the world. That's quite, quite a big wish. Uh, but uh, Raja, did you want to answer that or anyone else? I think I'll leave it to Lisa. Lisa. Well, I think that uh, that's a very good uh, question. And of course, the correct answer is yes. But the one of the things that I think the implicit um, lesson we learn from the, you know, the legacy and the work, ongoing work of Al-Haq, and as Lynn lays out, is that sometimes <clears throat> it's more important to really tackle the problem then try to find the solution because if you expose the nature of problems, that tends to have a life of its own. And so even the way that apartheid or and colonialism have become the analytical frames for looking at this context, um, that is, you know, came about as a result of the, you know, precise and detailed methodological work of documenting and monitoring and analyzing things. So, you know, I, I would say that, you know, understanding the problem is really a, a great contribution unto itself. And then what comes of it, you know, it puts information out into the world. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That means that uh, there is a call for more, uh, for more uh, exposure uh, and writing about uh, the topic is how I understand it. Uh, there's another question um, that is particularly important, which is the grassroots human rights activism for the protection of Palestinian rights. Uh, Shawan talked about the young generation and what they are doing. So in a sense, how does that relate to uh, the experience of Al-Haq? And how, what, what advice would you give to activists from your experience of Al-Haq's journey as a Palestinian human rights organi organization? Um, and this is a question from uh, Law for Palestine. Sounds interesting. So, Lynn, do you want to talk about this? Bishara? I'm afraid that I will have to pass this to, to Shawen. I mean, the question is, as a policy human rights activist, I think I'm, 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 I'm not qualified. <laughs> and I think, it, Shawen, you began to speak at the end of your final, last intervention there about the young generation. Uh, so I think really it would be to you to say any advice to young Palestinian human rights activists, many of whom you presumably know, but perhaps also outside Palestine as well as inside uh, Palestine. Look, I think uh, the hope is coming from uh, the new generation and uh, the change will come from there. Uh, the public and the young generation and the, activi <coughs> the activists is a very important role they play. But we address this question to ourselves. 
do we want to be like a grassroots organization or to stay as professional organizations, but in the same time strengthening the and helping, or let me say, cooperating with different groups, universities, others, uh, to give, you know, our uh, uh, human rights perspective, law perspective, uh, that's, and we decided not to go to that direction. But now, for instance, we have like trainings, uh, we try to strengthen in the capacity of different, you know, those that are interested of uh, uh, <clears throat> know more about the international law, the ICC, all of these things. Uh, I think even the language, if you follow the language these days of the uh, youngs and the youth uh, as a groups or those they are writing, you feel, you feel even the terms, the language of justice, law, human rights, these things. For instance, when we pushed the, uh, uh, the Palestinian leaders, mainly President Mahmoud Abbas, to accept to uh, go to the ICC, we made the ICC like uh, part of the public uh, opinion and narrative. We used to speak every day. And who pushed Mahmoud Abbas more? I think the young people, when they used to meet with him, mainly from Fatah, they asked him the first question they used to ask him. Why you don't go, for instance, and succeed acceded to the ICC? And he had no answer at that time. This is one main thing uh, that Dr. Saib Irakat said, and maybe Raja, may, I don't know if he heard that or not, but uh, every time he used to say this, we made it like part of the public opinion. That's the issue. I think youngs, they can make, youth, they can make, marching in the streets, this is their role and they can make a difference. What's going on, for instance, in Jerusalem? Uh, this is an issue we document. And we don't want to say that we are accounting the stakes that the people uh, is uh, receiving. But uh, we try to analyze all of these things. And we maintain the hope. We see that, for instance, from the course. I think uh, uh, it's not a copy that we have to uh, write a copy of al Haq and trying to uh, make others, other models the same. Each one, each side, each group, you know, has their own uh, role to play. But uh, we are now engaging with the young generations through the universities as much as we can. Uh, but we try not to politicize al haq And when I say politicize al haq taking al haq to, let me say, to any, to any political party to say, this is al haqs belong or affiliated with. I think this is one of the main success. It started at the beginning and the first day, and it has to continue. And this is the difference a little bit between us and other organizations in the uh, Arab region. And it was addressed during the 40th of Al-Haq, 40th anniversary, you know, from uh, some of the uh, human rights activists. They said our nature is completely different because we came from, you know, political parties and we try to deal with the organizations as part of the political party. That I think the danger and the risk for any organization like this to play its role. Our role is to generate, you know, knowledge, uh, uh, addressing uh, what's going on here, give it directions, legal directions, and uh, it can be used by anyone, you know, that's, the role of al-haq and this is what we are trying to deal with the activists and uh, others um is there anyone else who would like to talk about the kind of the the the, the, the human rights or the justice uh, political justice language that is coming through yeah richard i i thank you yeah thank you i would like to add to these comments um along the three categories that I mentioned before about the significance of Al-Haq, which is one in terms of the political imagination. And I think that is the argument I would uh, link to Lisa's piece. So uh, success without victory really has everything to do with how the political imagination has been reformulated um, to <coughs> uh, create a kind of a new 
way of seeing a new reality uh, along the lines that uh, Shawan just uh, gave examples of. And the other category I mentioned was institution building. And here I want to refer to Yost Hilterman, who wrote a wonderful uh, comment on, on the chat, um, saying, yeah, it's true, uh, but don't discount what al haq has done in terms of building um, the infrastructure for a kind of legal judicial system for a state that may not come or maybe so far off that we can never imagine it coming, but nevertheless, uh, everything that they've done in the last four decades or more has really built the basis for uh, uh, legal institutions in the best way possible. The, the, the last category I mentioned was knowledge production and here, I want to re-emphasize again how important Lynn's book is and how it fits so well with the New Direction of Palestinian Studies series in that she did not uh, take some theory from the Orleans or some theorist in the West and say, this is a good case study of, of that theory. She has basically built a, uh, a, a, an empirical but also a theoretical framework based on centering the experience of people and uh, events and uh, experiences that are usually never make it, or usually are erased in, um, in such studies. Uh, by centering the Palestinian experience and making it um, um, a platform for rethinking human rights globally, uh, for de-exceptionalizing the Palestinian condition, for thinking about how Al-Haq has really had um, much larger influence than just on the Palestinian question, I think uh, puts the horse before the cart in a lot of these knowledge production topics. And I'm very glad that we have yet another book that shows how effective and important that is. Uh, thank you, Bishara. This links to a question by Sami, and I'll go to other questions before it. Um, does Al-Haq have a strategy to reach people around the world? I can't see a social media presence and a lot of discussions today <sighs> through that space to reach the younger generation. So maybe a short answer to that, please, and then we'll go to other questions. Um, we have no uh, final strategy, but we have a deep, deep discussion these days. But we started, we have been starting since so long, you know, in the last 10 years to receive which called the summer school and the orientation courses and received also missions from outside and uh, collaborations with the, and cooperations with the uh, law clinics in different uh, universities received the students. Because of that, the Israeli groups and lobbyists, for instance, in the US, they wrote to many uh, uh, American universities that al is uh, anti-Semitic organization and uh, uh, tourist organizations, why you send your uh, uh, students to uh, al haq to receive, uh, for instance, courses, things like that. This has happened uh, two years ago. It was a big, big campaign, you know, and they wrote, you know, to the, uh, not to the deans, to the presidents, but to the councils of the universities like uh, uh, New York uh, University, uh, like uh, George Washington University, uh, like Stanford University, uh, things like that. We have this, for instance, we have with the academics in uh, US th through uh, organization called PARC. They bring, you know, students. These okay. days, these days we developed a very, very important thing. For instance, to the youth of the political parties outside in Europe, to have, you know, them, to receive them, or these days, because everything is virtual and online, we developed which called a live, a live uh, field tours, live. It's not, you know, edited and it's not recorded. Live field tour, you take them for two hours, three hours, and for them, they can engage with the victims, with the people, you know, directly, and you tell them the story about every space, every place where, where you go. Uh, that's an issue, for instance, it started now with the Netherlands and the uh, youth in the uh, different political parties in the Netherlands. And we want to expand it because it's a virtual and uh, it allows you, you know, to include uh, others mainly in, uh, in Europe. 
this is part of the, uh, it's not just an idea, it's a program now at Al-Haq, it's a project at uh, Al-Haq. Mm -hmm. And we have many, many things, you know, how to deal with the people. But for instance, after we saw the reaction from the public and from civil society and from people, you know, around the world, uh, I think now the big question is not before Al-Haq only, we started discussing this also internally uh, with the other uh, civil society organization, which is strategy that we have to take to strengthen the relations between here, Palestine, and the people outside everywhere. Thank you. Um, there is a related uh, response here from Frances Hasso. She says, congratulations. I look forward to reading the book oh, together. Hello, Francis. Hello, hello, Francis. Yeah, and she said, if, if you remember her, yes, hello, I remember her very and towards well. the end, she says that um, she she was detained on the coast taking a trip via Cyprus with hundreds of Al-Haq Arabic affidavits. Affidavits, yes. Palestinians <laughs> killed by uh, Mustari Bin that I was taking to Amman. Although I kept them because I kept saying, well, these people are dead. Working with Al-Haq radicalized me even further, if that was possible. So you do remember her, which is uh, really nice. Um, so uh, another question uh, from Shireen says, thank you for the great work. Is the book going to be available in Arabic? And uh, whether it is available for Palestinian students who come from impover impoverished backgrounds and maybe others? Coast I, I can answer the first bit and maybe Bishara wants to add it's, it's already on the site, it's free to download across the world. No one has to pay anything for it except your fees, your Wi-Fi fees or your whatever your, your service provider charges you, it's, it's free. The Arabic rights, Shawan and Bishara, I've kept, Bishara knows this, I've kept the Arabic translation rights uh, for myself. So I'll hack is free to have them if at any point you want to produce an Arabic translation for which I'm not volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that answers the so question. So hopefully there will be, but we'll have to maybe, unless Shawan wants to pass it to somebody else, but that's that's hopefully secured. Mm. Yeah, I think it's very important that the book come out in Arabic and we discuss this and I really hope that this can happen sooner rather than later. Uh, several people have asked, you know, how can we get the book or how can we access the book? So let, let's repeat once again that New Directions in Palestinian Studies book series of which this is part, is online open access free for all you can download the book right now and have it for free and the uh, link has been provided very kindly by aki and he can provide it again um, i encourage you all to not just download this book but the other books in this series <laughs> uh, uh, that are for free uh, for everyone across the world <clears throat> Regarding the translation, I will come in a few days. Not, uh, I will not exceed one week uh, to with answer, with a clear answer about uh, these things. And they hope to have like a date. And it's not a confidential thing to say that uh, Lynn, she speaks fluent Arabic. She reads Arabic. Uh, and she used to go through, you know, handwriting things to read because of that, I think it helps her, it helped her in this also research and it reached because she used to depend on herself, not on others, for instance, to translate her, her, you know, to her this or that. This is an issue. She can translate it, but we will not put that on her responsibility. We will take this responsibility Believe as a hug. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sharon. Um, she will edit. She will edit it in Arabic. I don't mind editing it. Mm. Yeah, uh, there's a, a, a comment from just uh, Hitlerman or, or Hitlerman. Hitlerman. <laughs> Apologies for the spell, for the misspelling. I can hardly read. Um, thank you all. I would just like to add one dimension of the ones mentioned uh, above in relation to the narrative about Luan occupation. Lynn and alluded to it, but Al-Haq was also part of Palestinian state building. I mean this in a non-political sense, without political objectives or affiliations. Any functioning democracy needs an independent judiciary yeah. and independent oversight mechanism. While Al-Haq was contesting a military occupation, it was also helping to build its alternative, an independent state with its trappings. That state may be far off, but the process itself and the institutions it generates is immensely significant. I guess that uh, isn't, is, is a comment. Um, 
rather than uh, a, a, a question. I, th I think it's a comment, but I think it's also something that was there. It became increasingly, um, oh, I think it's chapter four. Sorry, I can't remember. It became increasingly evident as Al Haq, well, first of all, it became more confident in its ability to sustain itself on the front of you know, hostility from the occupation authorities and its increasing profile. But probably Raja is better placed to speak to this. I think that what I started to say about human rights in Palestinian society and the idea of the rule of law, if you read the early correspondence, it was all about if there's a Palestinian state, that's what I mean by law as future, what do we want it to look like? It was so much part of this and resisting the occupation, but there was always that angle, quite unusually, I think, but I don't know, perhaps Rajal would like to say something about that? Yeah. Let me unmute. Yes, you're absolutely right. This was always uh, in the back of, our, in the front of our mind that if we want the Palestinian state, then we have to be instrumental in building it. And, and we are building it through uh, making people aware of the rule of law and of the use, use, importance of law and independence of the judiciary and all of that. And, and we, we, we did a lot of studies on all these aspects. Uh, unfortunately, there's no Palestinian state yet. Okay, thanks, Raja. Um, question from Lina. Marhaba, Lina. Um, thank you for a very interesting panel. I wish to ask uh, if there is an activity for Al Haq in Bethlehem. Yes or no? Is there an uh, uh, Jawan? Do you have? We, we 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 have a field worker there, and we have uh, activities uh, most of the time. Like for instance, taking the groups uh, around Bethlehem, you know, to show the uh, people what's going on near uh, Walaja and what's going on near Mahali and Hussan and other uh, places. Okay. Um, there's, I think, uh, I, I thought that uh, Bishara was typing an answer because someone was saying, I'm not seeing the answers on question and answers. Ex uh, example, Juiced, um, Hilterman's referenced. Perhaps the questions are only visible to the organizers. So I don't know whether there's an answer there that we haven't seen. Um, but there's another question from um, Muwara. The ongoing discussion of legal political strategies is very inspiring, and Al Haq's work is certainly groundbreaking. I was lucky to have participated participated in it, and it was extremely interested, etc. So that is just a comment. But I think there was an interesting question around. Um, from uh, Juiced again. Uh, thank you all. I would just add one dimension to the ones mentioned uh, above, which is, uh, yeah, about the political organization we've asked that. Uh, while Al Haq was contesting a military occupation, it was also helping to build its alternative. We've, we've done that uh, question. I'm just going through the other questions in the chat. Um, and I think we have answered most of them. I'm just going down in the list to see whether there's anything else. Um, okay. I Can I make a little shout out for the enforcement project? Yeah. I'm sure my... <laughs> well, I did mention it, but I wrote about it. It's what I worked on during very intense years at Al Haq after the first bit. So I just wanted to say, that also the impact of the enforcement project was just something I didn't talk about as well as the like other things, was taking that language of ensure respect, third party responsibility, grave breaches. A lot of that started, uh, you know, also it was part of the zeitgeist, part of the things that were going on in University of Sinshawan, but uh, the enforcement project has used language that was later taken up, I think it's fair to say, when across the Palestinian human rights movement, although at the time, the work of the enforcement project in Al-Haq, as I document in the book, was contentious, to say the controversial, contentious, contended, whatever. So that was a period in which I was involved. I didn't really want to say it, but I did say, because I also wanted to bring up the role of Charles Shemes as well as Jonathan Kater, but Charles, in terms of being the, the, the board member who worked on the enforcement project, um, also had a, a big impact in developing uh, arguments in international humanitarian law, um, which he then went on to argue with the International Red Cross in Geneva and 
uh, and still is. I think he's still arguing, isn't he? Oh, Charles is still arguing. I think we can fairly, fairly safely assume Charles is still arguing, correct? So, and very successfully often has done some amazing work. So I just wanted to bring that up as another ongoing uh, legacy with which al haq is still cooperating all in terms of business and human rights strategies and all this so there's yeah yes yeah, so there's, there's a lot there as well i i thought i should say it but nobody else has and i felt I could i make one this is one of the main thing we use uh Lim, and mm. uh if you go to what's happened also in uh, ireland uh about the irish motion might i think al -Haq yeah, has yeah. some role and uh, now in uh, chile Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I saw. Mm -hmm. Things uh, coming soon. Uh, we built also, and which called the enforcement a project because the enforcement now without enforcement, nothing will change. And this is the main thing guiding us in all of our, you know, analysis, all of our messages, uh, and advocacy work. Uh, thank you. Thank Please. you, Olin, and uh, thanks Gina, also I, for Shirley. Oh, could I make one point? Just a, a shout out about another project that's more recent that Al Haq has been involved with, which is the partnering with forensic architecture, and the collaboration. I'm putting in the chat the um, oops, sorry, the. Um, you know, the link to a sort of virtual video about the extrajudicial execution of Ahmed Erekat. But this kind of work speaks to the questions of, you know, bringing the work in the, of enforcement and al-Haq to an international audience, appealing to younger people, um, and also the social media aspect of it. And forensic architecture has now expanded to partner with um, the Euro European Court of Human Rights and to establish a um, a site in, in it, Germany, and Germany is a very important place to kind of be pushing on these issues. So I think that it's uh, something that, you know, Al-Haq should be commended for engaging, sort of really being super 21st century about this. Thank it's you, not that only, Lisa, there is which called the eyewitness things based also in uh, London. Mm. And this program, uh, it's an application you use it now when you go and you can document any incident happened. And this application has uh, GBS and it takes all the detailed information regarding the place, regarding the time, regarding you know uh, everything. And it goes directly, it's a protected one. It goes to database and uh, we have an access to this. And also the ICC, uh, uh, you know, uh, take this uh, database as one of the resource. And uh, this is an issue, you know, this is called the public documentation. It's not just only the uh, field workers documentation. And now we are training people in the field in different areas. Youth, you know, those, those they have uh, mobiles, everyone has a mobile these days. And now we are training online, you know, in Gaza, people in Gaza, human rights activists, students, anyone, anyone. It will become like a public training now for people. Uh, thank you, Shawan. We've got a question for uh, Raja from Lina. Uh, the issue of human rights and status people and access to health and other human rights are essential. So how can we address these issues in relation to Palestine? It's a huge question, I think, but it might be uh, a good question to kind of have uh, all the panel respond to it. Um, and maybe I, I would like, just in case we, we have uh, time, I would like to think about, you know, the language, uh, which is حقوق and haq, حقوق الشعب Palestini, which was kind of embraced by the PLO, you know, the right to de determination and so on, and the word al-haq itself. Uh, which I find al-Haq is much more kind of uh, uh, focused and important. So maybe we can talk about that later. But Raja, if you could kindly come in and and uh, and, and Lisa, yeah. The question is on the uh, right to health. Yeah, and, and how, you know, right to health and uh, uh, the question of rights and the question of health and the stateless people. And how can we address all these questions when we talk about Palestine? You know, these are 
what we call the right to health, the right to home, the right to live, the right to exist. These are, uh, you know, kind of rudimentary uh, human rights. But in relation to Palestinians, you know, how, how can we address them uh, in relation to Palestine? So it's a big question. Well, but I think, well, I, think I think the question is that in Palestine, with the uh, uh, it's 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 become more than an occupation. It's become a, a, a colonial uh, situation where where we are deprived of uh, uh, in the environment, the land, the the capacity to to live normally, to travel normally, to expand our uh, uh, the 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 plans that the Israelis put, and th these were the plans that they had already been working on since the early eighties, have resulted in uh, concentration of Palestinian uh, communities in cities and villages that are not allowed to expand beyond the borders of these places. And so the effect on, the, on all aspects of one's life as a result of these plans is tremendous. And, mm -hmm. and so it's all interrelated. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the Haq has done a lot of work on this throughout, from the beginning, uh, pointing out to, to, to these plans and, and to the how these violate uh, individual laws and international laws, local laws and international laws. So it's all, all related, I think. Thank you, Raja. Lisa, you wanted to say something? You wanted to come in? And Lynn? I would just say that the, the question of, um, you know, health access, you know, this the, the notion of public welfare, you know, linking that to stateless peoples, when people are ruled by a state that is not theirs and doesn't, you know, care about them. I mean, Pal Palestine is the archetype of this, but it's evident all around the world, ethno-national states, racist states, the, you know, treatment or criminalization of immigrants in, in, you know, Europe or the United States. And the one thing I would just say, like, we see this, you know, in the last year with the discriminatory um, access to COVID vaccines against COVID-19. And what that you know, sort of reinforces is the observation that we are seeing an apartheid state in action and, and public health or the lack of access to it is one very clear manifestation. So what you do with the critique of apartheid, linking it to health, I think is a very po important political project. Thank you, Lisa. Um, there's a question here that maybe Scott can answer, which is around what does the rule of law mean when military laws are still in practice? Uh, as the recent bombing in Gaza has shown. Uh, my comments here are, are not meant to be condescending, but as a question that we need to reach also, we need to kind of redefine laws as well as their function. The reference point can't be international law and expecting, uh, and expecting Palestinian rights to be recognized. Is there a need to speak, a new, to speak in a new language? And the last one, can Israel's continuing impunity be overcome through legal, uh, legal means? Um, Scott, do you want to kind of come in with any idea about do we need to and do you need to un unmute yourself? Yes, a, a, a couple of points in response to that, which is a, which is obviously an excellent and obvious challenge. I mean, why why continue to work within a framework within a regime which is itself fundamentally oppressive and rights denying? And and, and, it, I, and this is the same question, of course, that, that that apartheid lawyers had to face during the apartheid era. Why you know, cooperate uh, to the extent of, 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 of working with, in, the, in and under an oppressive regime? Um, and, and, and that's a question for which there's no sort of pat or ready answer. I mean, it, it, in a sense, one has to struggle on two fronts. And one has to struggle at the same time on the terms that one is given, that one is dealt, to play the hand one is dealt. At the same time, um, as one stands back, and offers a critique of the unfolding regime. And, and, and this brings to mind something that, that, that Lisa said, I mean, the title of her, 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 her response here, the world of Hawk made. I mean, I, 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 the, the, beyond the, 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 um, the slow case by case um, fight that, 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 that um, Hawk has been wage, waging sort of within the, the, the terms dictated, um, one, one also has to bear in mind the, 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 the larger consequences of its, of its role and its actions over time, the world al-Hakmeid. 
and, and, and I see, and I think one sees that at the very moment, right? So, so the, the, the colonialism apartheid framings, which once upon a time were fiercely resisted and contested, right? Are, are gaining increasing recognition and, and becoming common currency. And moreover, they're now being applied outside the case of the occupation to the Israeli state itself, which I think is hugely significant. Right, so now, we're, and, 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 and we spoke at the outset about the, the seriousness, the, the criticality of this moment in Palestinian history. And, and, and I think recent events um, have, 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 have showcased not just the, 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 the apartheid regime under the occupation, but the apartheid regime in the Israeli state itself. Um, and, and to me, that's, you know, that, 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 that sh again, it is a manifestation of a success without a clear victory, um, at least without without an immediate victory. Um, the, 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 so this this issue of framing um, goes right to the point of, of of the regime under which one is you know, on the terms of which one is continuing to struggle. So so one w wins um, occasional victories both within the terms of, of, of the regime and one, and one wins or notches successes when the understanding or the framing of the regime itself is challenged and altered. And I think those are both part of the world that Ohak has made. Sorry Thank for the... Thank you, Scott. That's very, uh, very articulate and important points. Anyone else would like to come in as we are coming to the end of the discussion? I would, yes. like, I, would, I would like to comment on one of the questions regarding the rule of law. Yeah. Here we have to differentiate between the definition and the meaning of the rule of law and the implementation of law. And when we speak about rule of law, we are taking it in a very wide uh, meaning. But the, the, uh, the cornerstone in that is justice. And here it refers me, the first thing I learned when I came to Al-Haq, it was the blue book, I think. It's, it's not the blue book, it's how to, to make a citation, no. It's uh, the color of the book, it was uh, blue at that time, uh, the uh, ICJ, I think, conference on the uh, rule of law and what's the meaning of rule of law. We are not taking it in a very limited way. For instance, the military orders mentioned. The military orders uh, are illegal. Most of them are illegal because it changed the uh, heritage law in the occupied territory and all of these things. And uh, also we are not recognizing the arbitrary uh, detention according law, all of these things. And here you speak about just law and unjust law. And here, you know, that's the meaning of rule of law, part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to come in uh, to say anything? Lynn? Well, uh, in, the, in the early days, uh, there was a question at al Haq whether we, it is right to intervene to the military and whether it is right to take cases into the high court and uh, Israeli high court. And uh, we knew the limits of intervening to the military and uh, of going to the high courts, but without doing that, we couldn't prove that their claims that this is a, a just uh, a, a benevolent occupation which allows the re residents of the occupied territory to, to appeal to the high court without having done the appeal and shown how ineffective it is, we couldn't have uh, uh, proven their uh, claims as wrong. So that, that was important. And, and I think sometimes that is a consideration in, in uh, taking part in a system that you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. And I think well, the same thing actually had, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I wanted to say the same idea must have been uh, faced by the people in the lawyers in, in, in South, uh, apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Shara? So, yeah. Um, so I, I want to uh, disentangle a little bit this success without victory sort of idea. Thank you, Lisa, for that, and Raja and Shawan for addressing it in, in more nuanced detail. Now, it, it is a much more of a, I mean, I'd love to give the title, the world of Hakbaid <laughs> you know, on this panel, it deserves it. 
But of course, it's a bit of an exaggeration uh, because it's not just a, a legal issue, it's, it's a legal mobilization project. So mm -hmm. the numbers of people who became involved and the caseworkers and their families and the issues uh, that kept them busy and the consequences of their work and their social networks and relationships really were very important uh, in helping to, and, and were affected by larger changes. I mean, when I think about the shift to a human rights framework to Palestinian instead of Palestine, this is something as Darwish said and many others have been going on since the seventies, if not earlier. Um, I would say even in, 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 the, in the mid sixties. Uh, and this required um, an enormous amount of work on an activist level, et cetera, et cetera. So I think al haq crystallized a lot of these efforts, made it a kind of a tip of the spear move and help open up new pathways, et cetera. But overall, really its significance is not in a particular case, but in a legal mobilization on a social level uh, that it both influenced and participated in. Um, and and that, that gives us more hope because it wasn't just out of the blue that they somehow gave us this gift, <laughs> but, but really, uh, uh, they, they, they helped crystallize an ongoing process. When the movement on social security here in Palestine started, you know, the uh, trade unionists and the, the others, they came to Al-Haq and we make like an analysis, what it means this right, and they took it. Yeah. And it became as, you know, a guide exactly. for them and their languages and their letters, to, 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 to teachers, for instance, when they were, when they had a strike, you know, they can also, they consulted with Al-Haq, what's your legal opinion? What things? This is what's going on internally here also about all of these uh, things. But we have a lot of things to do. We have many challenges in the same time, to be honest with you. At the end, we have a limit capacity, but I think we have a clear direction where to go. That's the, uh, the issue. Well, uh, with this note, thank you. I know there's a late question around the work with ICC and so on. So uh, for that question, uh, maybe you should read the book available online again. Uh, and we've put it all up. Thank you to Bishara for allowing this book to be available online in his uh, book series and for the other books that he's publishing. Thank you to Lynn for writing the book. Uh, to Raja for uh, working and being such a, you know, a diligent, hardworking uh, scholar, activist, lawyer on behalf of Palestinian rights. Uh, to Lisa, of course, for all her work on human rights, to Sharwan and to Scott. Um, so thanks all. And it was a fantastic panel. I really enjoyed it. And um, it will be recorded for everyone who is here uh, you can uh, see the recording on Facebook, which we will share. So thanks and have and a thank you, Dina, for uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, take thank care. You. Bye bye. Thanks everybody. Salamat to Judith, and if you will, can let me say initiate uh, the friends of Al Haq. بعدين صحتين على التين يعني كل عشر تيات. <laughs> okay. yeah, and I'll you. I will eat on behalf of all of you figs these days. Yes, please do eat them. Uh, please, I will do. I will send you the pictures. Virtual, please. virtual, you know, plate of tea. Wonderful. It's torture. <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. I, I thought you were pleased with the shower. Oh, thank you. Salamat to Akram, salamat to Akram. Okay, Bosan. And Salamat to Judith, I saw her name. Yes, also. I saw her name. Judith Dick also had a thank you for all my documentation. Thank you. She's also an Al Haq. Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you. Thank yes. you all and have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.